All right, we're live. Welcome to the Crypto Mining Tools podcast, everybody. I'm your host, Scott Offord, and we have your co-host, Ethan. Hey, everybody. Over there. And <laughs> our guest today is Apolline. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Yeah, so uh, where are you uh, based out of today? Uh, I'm currently in Cambridge, so locked down in, yeah, in a nice place, actually. Right. Uh -huh. <laughs> Could be worse, worse places to be locked out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm glad I'm not living in a big city. Yeah, so um, today we're here with Apolline and we're going to be talking a little bit about some research that uh, her team has done at Cambridge. And um, it's related to the blockchain industry. And, and Apolline, you, you were saying that your preference, you really like the, the cryptocurrency space uh, personally. Yeah. <laughs> I should have probably not say that online, but um, yeah, I think that's personal preference. But we do cover both space, both industries. That's industry. awesome. Yeah. So, so what, why don't you just tell us a little bit about about your program that you're in and um, kind of what you do and what got you there? Yeah, sure. Um, so, so the CCAF, which stands for the Center for Alternative Finance, uh, so it's a research institute at the University of Cambridge um, at the Judge Business School. And it was created back in 2015 and initially didn't look into uh, cryptocurrency specifically, um, but focused on like other stuff like digital lending, crowdfunding. And then in 2016, they created a crypto asset team. And essentially the research we do is, you know, uh, as I was saying before, is like more uh, focusing on the industry itself. Um, and so what we do mainly is these benchmarking studies, which are based on data that we directly collect from uh, companies. And so we have benchmarking studies for the crypto asset space, and we have another one for uh, the enterprise blockchain industry. Um, and so for the crypto asset space, we have two servers actually. So one for service providers and uh, another one for miners. That's Excellent. awesome. Well, yeah, so that sounds is, very relevant. Is this something that uh, you just like woke up one day and, and said, hey, let's do this guys? Or, <laughs> or how, how did it come to be? Like, was it just, you know, a meeting of the minds? Like we need to consider this or, yeah, how, how did you like get into this? And, and what were your thoughts when you first got into it? Like, oh, this is just, you know, this is just going to be a bunch of hokey. I'm going to expose it wide open. Yeah. Tell us your thoughts. So actually, I wasn't there when the, the, the team was created. So it was created, yeah, late 2016, but I just joined uh, early uh, 2018. Um, okay. But I think the, the reason was, um, so the, the way we define alternative finance is any financial instrument or system that emerged outside of the traditional system. Um, mm -hmm. And so obviously cryptocurrency kind of nicely fits uh, under this. Um, so that's why they came up with this. And then there was uh, two researchers who were leading the team. Um, yeah, and since then, I think it was kind of the first really report on this kind of trying to benchmark the industry. Um, and so since then we received really good feedback. And so that's why we, we kept it going. Yeah. yeah. Now, did you personally like volunteer to do this? Or again, was this something that you were just kind of assigned to do? Oh, no, no. Yeah. Um, so I, I was actually, so the first time when I kind of came across uh, cryptocurrency during my research was when I was based in China. But at this time, I was more focusing on like mobile finance. Um, and then I moved back to Europe and I was working for this industry association where uh, in France, where there were like a couple of uh, cryptocurrency mm -hmm. firms like Ledger and Coinhouse. And yeah, so like, yeah, this is definitely a topic that match my research interests and where I want to spend more time on. And then I found a position at Cambridge. Um, yeah, and it's it's really it's really fascinating because as, you, as we were saying offline is that, um, you know, the industry is just changing so quickly um, and we conduct this survey on an annual basis, more or less. Um, and it's it's pretty exciting to see it evolving. Yeah. So ha having this stuff to really look back on and to compare throughout the years is is really important because yeah like you said it, a lot of it changes quickly and, and as mm -hmm. we also said offline you know sometimes uh, some of it moves a little slowly like uh, other other sides of it you know we know that uh, the price of bitcoin and the adoption of bitcoin is always uh fluctuating uh, but on the other side the, the blockchain enterprise you know side of things it's it's like yeah, adoption is a little bit slower probably definitely yeah yeah, I mean, it's also because this the enterprise blockchain industry, I mean, the deployment of the technology is happening in highly regulated industries, whereas with established institutions, obviously, the, the rate of and the pace of adoption is slower. Traditionally, um, 
you know, where do you see these these alternative finance markets? Um, how do they do, do they ever integrate into the mainstream, or do they always stay apart from you know the mainstream financial you know system? Like, how, what what is this? How do let me put it this way? Can you give us kind of like a, a history of how these have always mm -hmm. kind of coexisted with mainstream financial systems and and what's happened in the history? Yeah, so we, we like to think of the life cycle of this alternative finance industry in like three stages. So the first one would just be, you know, the emergence of like um, problem solving solution, etc. that doesn't attract too much attention. But then it moves on to the second stage when, uh, you know, the public starts getting interested, investors as well, and especially the regulators start thinking that this needs to mm -hmm. be regulated. And so they usually the regulators start uh, putting out um, a regulatory framework or some guidance, and that drives further adoption. Um, and then we usually think that um, once these um, disruptors kind of become in integrated in the supply chain of the incumbents, or when they start uh, collaborating with them, or even replacing them, and then that you have um, a bespoke regulatory framework. That's when usually um, the industry can be considered as the new incumbent, if you like. So we saw that kind of happening with crowdfunding. Um, and then, yeah, we're also studying the regulatory landscape for crypto assets because definitely some jurisdictions are, are moving faster than, than other on this. Definitely, yeah. So, um, yeah, we've, we've seen some of your research online. Um, I think from the other year, uh, you had a um, the second global crypto asset benchmark study, right? It's, yeah, that's, that's a long title. One. Um, when, when was that one done? So this one was done, uh, released in December 2018, and we collected the data through that the summer of 2018. Um, and we're currently running the service for the third edition of this one. Um, and yeah, as I was mentioning, so it's mainly based on data provided by companies directly. Um, and we have two services, so one for service providers, which are like exchanges, mm -hmm. custodians, whatever, and then another mining survey for the mining actor specifically, again, okay. covering yeah, individual miners. So, so yeah. this this one here, it's it's available on, on your website, uh, mm -hmm. jbs.cam.ac.uk. <laughs> um, I didn't think you would actually try to pronounce the URL. We'll have to keep on going. <laughs> Faculty-research. <laughs> right. I think if you Google maybe CCAF benchmarking study, it would be yeah. like good. And, and Google. Right. So, so I have a question for you, Apolline. Um, how do you get these companies to cooperate and, and give you information? Is is there some kind of secret recipe to do that? And how do you even find the companies to begin with? Yeah, um, that's actually, I think, the most challenging part. And that's why we spend so much time actually collecting the data. Um, so I, I think the first survey was the hardest probably to get. Um, so I joined when we did the second study. Um, and so we have our own directory of, of companies who operate in the space and we try to maintain that to you know identify any new companies or seeing any companies that uh, that is going under. Um, then we have some personal connection as well. And so that's you know just first identifying company. Then we rely a lot on industry associations. So we would collaborate a lot with you know um, the like of what is the biggest, industry association in in the US. Um, yeah, you will have the Digital Chamber of Commerce, then you will have, mm -hmm. you know, blockchain, uh, Bitcoin, Hong Kong, etc. So we partner these di with these different associations to ask them to um, share the survey with their members. Um, so that's one. Then we have also uh, crypto native outlets who can help us distribute the survey. So we had uh, Coindesk, uh, Coindesk Korea, Coindesk Japan, who help us as well distribute um, in these different regions. And I think the most important thing is to have, um, first of all, the surveys translated in different languages. So we have it in seven different languages. And then oh, wow. we have on the people who can speak uh, five of these at least. And, you know, it's just a constant struggle to just reach out to people individually. Um, we have a few interns working on, uh, you know, reaching out to people through telegrams and that's how they find you. If yep. you like, <laughs> so yeah, it's really trying all the different channels and using the the channels that uh, crypto asset actors are using in their region. So Telegram would be uh, prevalent for mining and in certain regions. Otherwise, it would be WeChat in China. So we're really trying to maximize uh, the outreach. Right, right. Well, it, it definitely worked. You know, you uh, you guys were on Telegram, and that's definitely where a lot of the uh, the crypto people hang out um, and people in the mining industry. And that's, that's where I heard about the the third 
um, survey that you guys are working on. Uh, yeah. Oh, Scott has just uh, disappeared there. So oh. Scott was uh, was talking about uh, your most recent survey that uh, mm -hmm. you were working on. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah. So it's um, so I, I'm just going to speak about the, the mining survey because this is probably the most relevant. So in the mining survey, we um, have different block of questions for uh, the different uh, actors that operate in the space. So we will have one for miners, one for hardware manufacturers, um, another one for pool operators, um, and, and so they. Have have like specific questions that covers you know anything from risk management strategies to cost structure, um, customer base, uh, etc. And then we have a set of like sentiment question, a bit like I think you guys did also a similar survey, right? When you were when you were asking um, miners what they were thinking of, you know, what will happen to them post halving. Right. Um, so yeah, that's what we're trying to to capture. So that's the landing landing page. Uh, <laughs> don't be scared. It's just like the compliance form that we have to uh, <laughs> where we have to get consent from from respondent. Yeah. So and these, yeah, I think it, I, I was going to ask these respondents, um, do you have to sign non-disclosure agreements with them or do you just assure their, you know, anonymity or like, um, like how, how do you, yeah. you uh, assure that they can give you accurate and reliable information? How about that? So, so that what you're seeing here is the, um, so that's what's on the landing page and that's mm -hmm. kind of a, of an NDA, if you like. Um, and so we do ask respondents to provide us with contact details. Uh, by the way, this is, you know, completely reviewed by the ethics and compliance that's at the university. Um, so we do ask people to provide us with their contact details in case we need to double check the, the responses they provided us. Um, mm -hmm. But then we don't store it post uh, verification process. Um, so that's okay. one way. Obviously, um, yeah, we and we have, you know, we have to comply with university standards in terms of like privacy management and mm -hmm. um, yeah, data storage, etc. So, uh, so yeah. once once you've verified and validated the information, you aggregate it and then it's just wiped out. It yeah, then we anonymize through. all the data yeah. sets, and um, so we we only pr present findings also at the aggregate level. So it would be you know by country, by region, by sector. Um, the, the issue being that we don't have probably enough uh, observations yet to actually being able to do a further like breakdown like per country. So we usually focus on um, the region like Asia Pacific, Europe, etc. Whereas like other teams within the center where they have like thousands of respondents, uh, they can actually provide more uh, granular um, insights. Mm -hmm. That is really fascinating. That is so really I'll, awesome. I'll actually share this uh, link here in our chat. And let's see here. So I made a short link. It's just um, bit.ly slash survey dash blockchain. Mm -hmm. And uh, so somebody can go there and find the URL to that to that survey. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, it's it's this uh, jbs.eu, whatever, whatever, qualtrics.com. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, uh, that is where people can find this survey right now. Just yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, everyone in our industry, you know, please, uh, you know, if, if you're a big player and, and you know, you haven't been contacted by Appaline yet, you know, please uh, make an effort to help her with her efforts. Because yeah. it helps us all, you know, helps us all. And um, yeah. Appaline, when, when is the uh, the cutoff for this? When, when are you uh, stopping the, the collection? So of the data? officially the deadline is Sunday. Uh, oh. But we already got a few requests uh, from from people to extend it, so uh, we're probably going to extend by, by at least one week. Uh, okay. But yeah, I think like again, I would just like to emphasize that um, the more respondents we get, the merrier, because it means that the finding that of of the study is are they not more representative of the industry. So yeah, yeah, yeah. and um, I can't remember. It, it, did it say that it takes maybe about twenty minutes to to fill in the survey? Yeah. If yeah, if you you know if you really want to respond everything accurately, etc., you should take about twenty minutes. Then obviously we know that people might want to skip a bit faster, so we don't make all the questions mandatory. Like only maybe ten of them are. Um, and so if you focus only on these mandatory questions, it's probably no more than ten minutes. Yeah. Okay. That is really awesome. I'm gonna take a second now um, just to do a big shout out to our sponsor of today's po podcast, Nova Block. Nova Block um, is a new mining pool to the industry, uh, but in the short time that they've been in the industry, I think they're now in the top 15. I, I don't know if you can confirm that or not, Scott, but um, I believe they've made it to the top 15. Right. They're, they're highly endorsed by one of our guests that came on to the show, 
And they believe that as the hashing power migrates from China to North America, they wanted to provide a better pool, a better pool for their customers. And again, this has been confirmed by uh, one of our esteemed guests on here. And they believe that by giving the customer education and transparency, they create a better pool. And Scott's gonna tell you guys how to get a great deal from them. Absolutely, yeah. So if you go to their website and actually enter um, an invitation code when you sign up, uh, on the top right hand side, there's a sign up link. And if you enter offered 18, O-F-F-O-R-D-1-8, when you sign up, um, you'll get a permanent reduction in your mining fees down to 1.8%. Um, so definitely give that a try. And we are very appreciative to Nova Block for sponsoring our podcast because it really helps us to just get the word out and to keep on sharing this awesome stuff with uh, with our audience. Absolutely. And, and one more thing, if you have a lot of hash power, I mean, I'm talking like if you've got a big mining facility and you guys want a better deal, maybe you have a really good deal with, with the pool you're working with now, but you want a good deal, give Nova Block a shot. Reach out to them. They will work with you. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for that. Um, so, Apolline, uh, we want to hear about some other stuff that you're working on. Uh, it sounds like you were just able to publish something very recently. Yeah, actually. So yesterday we released this, uh, what we call the Bitcoin mining map, which is actually um, an interactive map that visualizes the geographic distribution of Bitcoin hash rate. Um, so that's a map that is built with uh, the support of like three mining pools who provided us with, with data um, about the, the geographic location of hash rates co connecting to their pools. Um, so yeah, I should add that these three pools, so BTC.com, Pooling, and via BTC, only represent thirty-seven percent. You know, yeah. Of the total yeah. So uh, we're kind of extrapolating from that, uh, and that's something uh, users should be aware of. Um, but the idea was to provide, um, yeah, a more reliable picture of the geographic distribution of hash rate. Um, so the map, uh, as you're showing it, so you can have it at the country level, and then we have a special focus on Chinese provinces. Um, and that's part of a, a broader project that we started last July um, called the Cambridge Bitcoin Electricity Consumption Index. Um, I don't know if you've been you've heard of it before, but um, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So th the idea is, um, you know, there was there is this ongoing debate about uh, Bitcoin's contribution to global warming or not. So on one side, you would have the you know the critics of Bitcoin that said it's boiling the planet and whatever. Um, and then on the other side, you would have uh, people arguing that Bitcoin is driving the green revolution. So we wanted to provide some nuances in this debate. Um, and so we started by launching this CBCI, as we call it, uh, which is a real-time estimate of the amount of electricity consumed by the Bitcoin network. So obviously, this doesn't necessarily answer the sustainability question, because you need to know then the geographic location of these hashing facilities, um, the energy mix as well. Um, and so that's kind of the second steps, um, which was to get a more accurate picture of the geographic distribution um, of Bitcoin's hash rate. Yeah. So what are, what are your initial thoughts uh, about your findings? So, yeah, it's it's quite interesting. I mean, I think uh, it would come at uh, not, no surprise to anyone in the mining industry that the lion's share of hash rate is taking place in, in China. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it might be a bit surprising that it's that high. So it, it varies from 75% to 65% recently, uh, because previous estimate that we saw in, in different reports were more around like 65%. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I mean, so that's that kind of validates this, this intuition. Um, the, the other interesting finding is that, um, so as I said, so the, the, the period covered is from September 2019 to April 2020. Um, and so back in September 20, uh, 2019, China represented about 75% um, of the hash rates and now it's at 65%. Um, and so it might confirm the, the narratives that, you know, uh, the growth that we expected to come from China is actually coming from other regions outside of China. Um, and these could be, yeah, so like Kazakhstan, uh, Russia, mm -hmm. um, Iran as well. And I think what came as, um, as a big surprise actually was Malaysia. We didn't expect, um, yeah, such a high. Um, oh, that, that doesn't <laughs> surprise me at all. It doesn't <laughs> surprise you, Scott. <laughs> well, I mean, there there are some things going on down there in, in Malaysia. Well, Great. you know, let's, let, let's see. What's happening in Malaysia that could cause yeah. a lot of hash rate to come from there? Hmm. Yeah. 
yeah, it, it <laughs> I, I guess a... we just didn't expect that it would be uh, that that significant. Um, yeah, but that's good to get confirmation. <laughs> yeah. So um, on this first map, it's it's the average monthly share. And mm -hmm. and and so how do you how do you explain share? What what does that mean to you? So we got the. Um, uh, so, so the different pools provided us with the aggregate uh, data at the country and uh, and pro Chinese provincial provincial level, and so then we were able to calculate um, the the share of each country or each provinces for uh, the the hash rate represented in these pools. Okay, uh, what and is your uh, your margin of error? Just uh, out of curiosity. Um, I think. We, uh, I don't know exactly. Um, I think there was a, a bit of a uncertainty regarding like um, miners potentially using VPNs. Um, so that's one of mm -hmm. the limitations that we highlighted in, in this. Um, and that was actually specifically present in one of the pools data. Um, and that was pointed out by the pool operator actually. So what we did, it was to actually uh, redistribute the share of Zhejiang's province to other provinces uh, pro uh, presented and listed in the uh, pool's data set. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, I, I, other than the map, uh, the visualizations, uh, you, you do go through the methodology and, and the comparison and um, and some other, other things in here. Mm. Yeah. And I think an, another uh, nice thing when you dive into uh, the Chinese provinces is that we see, again, that's uh, that's something that is pretty well known about these migration patterns of miners uh, going to, to Sichuan during the rainy season, so between uh, May and October, and then moving out of Sichuan to relocate in like Xinjiang and, and Inner Mongolia. And so that's, again, something that is confirmed. Um, huh. Yeah. Now, that's something that I, I didn't know about because... Uh, I don't know if if anybody have you ever been to a mining farm? Have you ever taken them apart and put them back together or anything like that? So we had the chance to uh, visit a mining farm actually uh, during the summit organized by Miner Updates. Um, so they took a group of us uh, to to a mining farm in Sichuan uh, next to Chengdu. Uh, but yeah, I have to say in China that's the only one I visited. Well, I mean, these miners they're they're not only loud <laughs> and, and mm. produce a lot of heat, but they're also you know pretty heavy they they weigh roughly um i don't know about uh, 10 kilos a piece and um the the little you know connectors on them they're very hard on your hands <laughs> and and if you've ever had yeah. even just taking apart 10 of them you know just 10 different miners taking the power supply off of them it's i mean your hands are sore and you know 10 kilos it's not much to hold once but if you hold that a hundred times or two hundred times, and these farms, they have thousands of these miners. So I couldn't imagine packing these up, you know, every season <laughs> and moving them to a completely location, unpacking them, putting them back on shelves. I mean, the the labor involved that is just mind boggling to me. I, I had no idea that they put that much effort into it. Yeah. Well, I guess the, the the benefits. I mean, during the rainy season, the electricity costs are very low in Sichuan. I think um, someone was saying below three cents per kilowatt hour. So right. That is a, yeah. Yeah. So I, it's I guess it's worth it to them to to yeah. go through all that effort. <laughs> to, to I, I would just you know I would have two farms. <laughs> so I would have farm A and I had to farm farm B. Yeah, I mean and that's farm B would just turn off, you know, farm A would turn on and farm B would turn yeah. off and vice versa. I wouldn't bother trucking the the miners back and forth. That'd be too much effort for me. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean it's it's crazy. But then, you know, you got to think that um if you're turning one off, what are you going to do with that gear because every day that goes by, it's getting uh less efficient, you know, relative to the other gear that the other farms have. And, you know, you just kind of have to think, well, am I going to sell these miners or am I just going to turn them off or am I going to move them? Right. See, that's where I would go to Telegram and I would reach out to Scott Offer. <laughs> there we go. And I would say, Scott, I've got 2000 of these. I need you to sell and I need you to sell them in two weeks. <laughs> and that's what we do. Yes. And then, that, and that, yeah. Or I would go to crypto mining tools and I would list them on the crypto mining tools uh, shop. And and sell them there. <laughs> now, so now that's Abilene, our plug for, for yeah, ourselves there. Right, we, we got to do a little plug. <laughs> yeah. Abilene, you you know a lot, um, quite a bit about uh, you know the finance industry and and uh, just some fascinating insights. 
into you know what's going on in in the mining industry tell us uh what are your thoughts about the upcoming happening what what do you think is is going to happen i'm afraid i might be a, a bit disappointing now because uh I, actually we don't follow that closely i mean we haven't run any you know studies on that um um but so i guess you know um we can expect what we can expect right so some the less profitable miners uh, at the current difficulty level will probably shut off their machines and yeah the the most profitable will stay on um i think that's all i can say for now yeah yeah um, i mean I, i've i've heard it uh said before by other people you know before the happening as it's approaching a lot of people are talking about it um mm. but when it comes down to it you, you really don't know because it it's um an impact that kind of takes place over over time mm -hmm. uh, you know it's not like overnight uh the bitcoin price is gonna skyrocket or anything um mm. the only thing that literally happens is uh the bitcoin reward gets cut in half immediately so that has an immediate impact on every every miner that that's mining um a, a bitcoin uh, coin uh they're impacted by that but the reward uh or the um price of Bitcoin in return might go up, you know, typically in the last few years, uh, when there has been an happening, the, the price has slowly gone up over time. Um, so I guess, I guess we'll see, you know, uh, how, how many days is it? Is it coming in, Ethan? Uh, is it five? Oh, days? yeah. I mean, oh. it's, it's less than a week, I believe. Um, yeah. Here's what's really interesting to me, though, Scott, is that previous, previous happenings have happened with the majority hash rate um, being globally distributed, like nobody really had the majority hash rate. I'm really curious what will happen this time now that, you know, looking at your research that, you know, the, the hash rate looks dominated by China. Um, mm -hmm. So will will that have an impact, a major impact or an influence on this happening versus previous happenings? Right. Yeah. yeah, that's definitely something we're curious to see as well in the data, uh, if we can, you know, in future iteration of, of the map, uh, see how this will have impact the geographic distribution of, um, yeah, of hash rate. Yeah. So is, is there anything else uh, that you want to share about what you're working on um, or, or anything? Yeah. You got any secrets? <laughs> No, we don't have. I mean, we're working on a couple of other projects uh, related to crypto assets. So one is um, looking more at the crypto asset ecosystem atlas. So we're trying to provide a historical overview of how the industry has evolved over time. You know, what companies were operating in, uh, where were their base, etc. So um, that, yeah, that might be live like end of September, something like this. Okay. Um, otherwise, yeah, the crypto asset benchmarking study takes actually quite a bit of time. Um, and, and I think it's yeah really important to just emphasize how this can be relevant for the industry as well, because as a miner, I mean, surely the industry is pretty small, so everyone knows everyone and you can have a yes. rough idea of, of these data points, but actually having some um, reliable data for other regions mm -hmm. is actually useful to benchmark your operations um, against one of uh, other other ones. Um, yeah, yeah and, and also like, I think the center really acts as a, you know, we're at the crossroads of different audiences, so we're not just speaking to the to the industry. We also have engaging a lot with regulators, with investors, with the rest of the academia. So if we can somehow manage to make sure to maintain the communication channel between these different audiences and provide data that is useful to all of them, I think yeah, that would be quite helpful for everyone. In in the time of your study, have you seen more institutional adoption or less, or has it just remained constant? So actually, that's something we, we we cover in the service provider survey, where we ask um, the service providers the share of the uh, of their customer base and how, how much of them come from institutions. Um, and so back in yeah, 2018, it was still mainly retail driven. And I'm curious to see uh, what would be the data for this year, but I'm not expecting a, a major change. Okay, so I guess uh, it, it's not retracting, but you're not seeing it as, as growing and expanding either. But there is definitely interest, though. Like there is a mm -hmm. even even for for us. Like sometimes we're just asked by different you know financial institutions to uh, present or give them some uh, some more um, yeah presentation on the topic. Yeah. What what have you learned so far, or or what do you see so far? Is the primary use of Bitcoin? Is it just a, a generic financial instrument? Is it a store of value? Is it 
an investment? What what do you see it as? I think, yeah, I mean, definitely, like, yeah, the store of value narratives uh, is quite appealing to a lot of people. Um, it's, it's difficult to get, like, accurate data about the usage as well. I mean, there is a lot of, yeah, speculation going on. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's difficult to say what is the actual use case. But, yeah, the store of value is definitely an interesting one, especially because I think, I mean, you know, a lot of people are talking about cryptocurrency, banking, the unbank, but I don't think that's ever going to happen, you know, anytime soon. Uh, rather, what we see is digital native who are exploring with this, uh, with this new type of assets. Um, yeah. So it's interesting you call it a, an asset. That's, that's, yeah. I, I'll, yeah. I'll take, well, I'll take a cue from that. <laughs> I think in many, I mean, definitely when you, we have a, a pretty narrow definition of, of crypto assets. Um, so that would, which would apply primarily to Bitcoin and Ether um, to another extent. But um, yeah, it, it actually comes with, it, it does create a lot of innovations, uh, not just, you know, in the techno, uh, technical part, but also mm -hmm. like from a legal perspective. Um, it's actually quite a, a big question for cert certain um, legal experts whether um, Bitcoin can be considered as an object of ownership rights and property rights. So um, you have different courts that have ruled on that as well, but it's pretty fascinating. And, yeah. and then, you know, there's also the blockchain, you know, technology yeah. that, that goes in behind it that, you know, can give, um, you know, like a, a history or a validation of a history. Providence, I think, is what we call it. It, it mm -hmm. can give a providence of how things came to be and, and who had ownership of what and how it changed hands, um, yeah. which is, which is fascinating, fascinating technology. Yeah. Uh, well, we're coming to the end of our stream here. Um, I just wanted to share one more time for the listeners where we can find that, uh, newest survey that's ending in a, in a week or so here. Yeah. And if you just go to, uh, bit.ly slash survey dash blockchain, um, that will call up that, um, that URL again, and uh, let's see, where was that survey? Uh, the third global crypto asset mining survey, is that the one? The, yeah, the, the third yeah. one. And yeah. and it's gonna be extended. Uh, the deadline's supposed to be this Sunday, but uh, you yeah, know, we're gonna if, keep if it you... Until, yeah, probably yeah. the 18th of, uh, of May. And otherwise you can find me on Twitter and I think it's one of, it's my pinned tweet, so. Yes, yes, please let uh, our, our audience know what is the best way to reach out to you, Apolline, if they have more questions or would like yeah. to be a part. Yeah, I guess Twitter yeah. is probably, yeah, that's that's the- right Twitter, Twitter is the best way? At Apolline yeah. Blandon. 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 Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> French, right, 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 that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, excellent. Um, yeah, again, thanks uh, for your time today and for just explaining a little bit about your uh, blockchain and mining space um, research. It was great talking with you. Yeah, very informative. So Thank you very me. much. Right. All right. Thanks a lot. Right. Bye, -bye. Bye, yes. All right. All right. Bye, bye.